Target. We are live right now, Unchained TV, bringing you trial coverage wrap up of the Smithfield trial, which ended in not guilty verdicts, as well as today is a day that could decide the fate of millions, even billions of pigs as the U.S. Supreme Court considers the issue of pig gestation crates. We are so honored to have a really esteemed panel. We're going to begin with Chris Green, and you are the executive director of the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School. <clears throat> you were extremely involved in the amicus brief filed, filed on behalf of the pigs arguing animal welfare. You were at the Supreme Court today, Chris. Take us there. What happened? Yeah, it was a really interesting day. We weren't really sure what was going to happen as far as how the justices were going to react. Um, as I said around a little bit, um, no one was exactly sure why the Supreme Court decided to grant certiorari in this case, because pretty much every other court that's looked at these issues has thrown them out. And that's exactly why we're at the court here on a, a motion to dismiss. The trial court uh, threw the case out. It didn't even say there wasn't even enough of, of an issue here to take it to trial. And the Ninth Circuit agreed. So um there was good there's probably about 100 people lined up today to get in to see the the case and um it was really interesting to hear the questions that were asked uh, i think um this is such an issue that crosses so many different lines you've got some typically conservative justices like justice thomas and gorsuch who really don't care much for the dormant commerce clause so they were uh, oddly enough two of the sort of votes that could be most counted on on the side of the pigs today um then you've got other justices such as uh uh, Kavanaugh and Alito. Uh, Alito is sort of most sympathetic to the Roman Commerce Clause, and so they were pretty much far on the other side. So it was pretty much a toss-up on uh, how those in the, the justices in the, in the middle were going to react. And they asked some very pointed questions uh, of both sides, but um, they definitely heard all the issues, and they were they were thinking very hard about it. So I I definitely feel better about things uh, today than I did uh, at 5:45 this morning when I went and lined up. Wow. And you also wrote with the famed uh, lawyer, Lawrence Tribe, an op-ed in the Los Angeles, Los Angeles Times that says the Supreme Court shouldn't meddle with California standards on meat and eggs, in which you argued um, that there is a health issue. Um, you said essentially that um, this could, these pig gestation crates actually can be harbingers of disease. So it it is a welfare case, but it is also very much a case of human health. Can you summarize what your argument was in the Los Angeles Times opinion piece? Yeah, I mean, there was a, a was the folks who were working on this case were very strategic in that we had a uh, amicus briefs submitted from all sorts of different uh, constituencies, which are small farmers groups, public health groups. Uh, I think the American Public Health Association was the lead on the public health brief you're referring to. Um, there's a great article about that in the Chicago Tribune this week. Um, but it, yeah, when you when you stress out pigs the way and you're showing these horrific photographs, um, it's extremely stressful on them to be confined in the way that they are. And so, as we all know, the more stresses our body endure, uh, the less healthy we become. And so not only and when you get more stressed, uh, it makes you more susceptible to illness and disease. So that's on the mother pig side, but also the reason they want these gestation crates is so producers can pack so many of these animals together at the same time. So these poor mother pigs are just crammed side by side. And again, when you cram that many animals so closely together, it's just a, a Petri dish for diseases to both sort of mutate and, and rapidly rapidly spread from, from all the pigs to the others. And the same thing is true of the piglets that are then born into these really uh, cramped, confined environments that are just, and that's why so many places use things like antibiotics and things like that, because it's just unnatural to house that many animals so closely together. Now, all of this is happening in a very short time frame where pigs are suddenly front and center on the national agenda, even though the mainstream TV networks have generally ignored it. There are some exceptions, but um, just this past Saturday, not guilty on all counts for Wayne Shung and Paul Picklesheimer of Direct Action Everywhere, who went into one of the largest pig uh, breeding facilities in the world where there are tons of these pig gestation crates, even though the company had said they were phasing them out. Um, they went in 
to see whether they had phased them out. And voila, no, they hadn't. This is back in 2017. And the video is completely gruesome. Uh, we will show you some of it. But first, I want to show you the victory celebration uh, that occurred and try to see if there's a connection between these two cases. Certainly there is, because the jurors, even they, they didn't even see the pig gestation crates, but they got a sense of the nightmarish um, experience that it would be to be trapped in one of these industrialized farms. But I do think this is the first domino, you know, legally, because if if we have the right to rescue these two animals, we have the right to rescue the rest too. And, and that's where we're going. And for those who think this is vigilantism or too revolutionary, I will just say this. Anyone who looks into the eyes of a baby pig like Lily, when we were looking at her inside that factory farm, and try, even for a moment, even for a half a millisecond, to understand what she was going through, would reach exactly the same conclusion that we've reached, which is that these industries are an abomination on the planet, on our food system, and on the human spirit. And it's an abomination that needs to be cleansed. And, you know, there's survey evidence showing that one or two Americans, one factory farms and slaughterhouses shut down. It's starting. All of the DXE people If a jury in southern Utah that is a heavily agricultural region of the country, that is 75-25 Trump, that is entirely white, we had an entirely white jury assessing the guilt or innocence of a Chinese person from Berkeley who's a vegan and a Buddhist. If we can win here, we will win everywhere. I want to go to Carla. Carla, you were there. You were holding the camera for that interview. Do you see a connection between these two cases? Saturday, a conservative jury or a jury in a conservative state acquits two men who went in to document whether these pig gestation crates the company had promised to phase out were still there. They were there. They removed two piglets who were clearly sick. They were acquitted not guilty on all counts. And now the Supreme Court is considering um, the pork industry's challenge to a California ban on the very same kind of crates, Carla. Absolutely, there is a connection and, and hopefully the Supreme Court will come to the same conclusion that these gestation crates are cruel and unusual punishment, that this is torture for these animals and they need to be ended. Um, Curtis Vollmer, you were there, you were there for the verdict. You were also considered the reason why uh, those defendants got a change of venue to um, a less company town. Um, I've got to play uh, the video that I believe you recorded. It's about two minutes, but then we're going to have a big discussion because you also have a court case coming up, um, I think, it's tomorrow that uh, basically says that on top of whatever cruelty is going on, there's a violation of First Amendment rights. Let's check this out. You have to have a permit. Permit to, to, uh, for a sidewalk? Let me get my camera on too. Sure. Okay. You're not to this be. This is not a good look. You're not, you're not to be spread. This is not a good look. You're not supposed to be down here. This is public property. You're not to be down here doing this. Do you realize? Do you realize that your your company caused a problem in our community? Do you have anything relevant to say to me? Yes, I do. Okay. I've asked you to stop. Okay, I'm on public property. You need to stop. Okay. Go ahead. You need to stop. You realize you're not wanted in this community and you've been asked to leave? I don't care. I know you don't care. That's the problem with your group. You just don't care about people or anybody. Do you understand? You've been asked to leave. 
all of this for handing out some flyers. This is how much all, all promotion. Of this is because all of this because your your group has has been a direct influence on shutting down Smithfield Foods. You don't realize that's the major employer in our county. You don't think and I know that? Lot, there's a lot of people that have lost their jobs, and you come into this community and pour salt into the wounds of the people that have lost their jobs. It's not okay? the intent. You need to. St well, I don't care what the intent is. What you're doing is causing a disturbance in the community. I'm not and trying yes, to cause a disturbance. Oh well, I'm just trying are. to have conversations okay, with people. You are. And if people don't want to talk with me, I say thanks okay. for your time and okay. on with your day. I, okay. I'm going to stand right here and I'm going to tell people not to talk to you. Then fine, do that. Okay. This is great content for us. Absolutely ridiculous. This is, oh, is, it this ridiculous? is very anti-free speech. Wow. So before we get to the rest of the panel, Curtis, uh, that's your video, right? You recorded that. And as a result of that, there was a change of venue to another part of Utah, uh, St. George, which is a little more cosmopolitan, a little less just a company town. You know, that video and your actions after it might have actually been a key factor in a not guilty the not guilty verdicts. Take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the, on the panel here. Uh, I actually talked with uh, Wayne and Paul and Almira on a podcast a couple days ago, and, and we talked about this same kind of incident, and Wayne was saying the same thing, like, you know, this... Uh, <laughs> This action in, in July back in Beaver County might be the reason that, that we won. And not, I'm not trying to take credit for Wayne and Paul, you know, being acquitted or, or anything like that. Definitely a team effort. There was definitely a lot of things, you know, the stars aligned on, on many fronts. But that, that video and, and the virality of it and the content of what those officers said was definitely uh, something that the judge considered when he did end up granting the motion to change to change venues now i want to bring in nathan semmel former assistant district attorney and prominent litigator in new york what i see as a common theme a commonality is sort of a disrespect for the beliefs and the freedom of speech and the um ability of everyday americans to have an opinion you know, the judge in the case acted like this was an open shut case and you guys, even kept, he even kept referring when you appeal, <clears throat> presuming there was going to be a guilty verdict. In this case, the sheriff um, seems to me completely out of bounds. OK, and let's hope the Supreme Court has a different take than these other sort of powers that be, Nathan. Yeah, I mean, you really do see a connection there, right? I mean, you have um, prejudging that went on in, uh, you know, in Wayne and Paul's case. You had members of the supporters who were excluded from the courtroom, press that was excluded from the courtroom. I think anybody who watched some of the um, some of the trials saw Wayne, uh, who represented himself, treated with a degree of disdain despite his professionalism. Um, and then you see uh, Curtis on the street being um, spoken to in the manner in which he was by somebody, if he weren't a police officer, would have the right to say what he did. Uh, he'd be wrong, but he'd have the right to say it. But this is a person operating who has taken an oath to uphold the Constitution and is saying, you know, words we have heard in this nation's history before, you are not wanted here. And that is a very dark place for this country to be when law enforcement is staying that on camera without hesitation. Um, All right. Uh, and thank you for everybody. Don't touch or you do paperwork. Do paperwork afterwards. It creates a crackle. Um, I want to go back to Chris Green. Again, you filed uh, the amicus brief. I guess that's the friend of the court brief arguing for animal welfare. Um, do you see a commonality here where it's almost like the government, whether it's local law enforcement, whether it's um, somebody's crackling and they're going to get spanked, <laughs> whether it's local law enforcement, whether it's a, a, a court, whether it's a prosecutor who in the case essentially said that the judge referred to the prosecution as um, 
has um, basically represented um, the company. That was something that I had never heard in a court before, almost like a client basis. Do you think that the Supreme Court is going to distinguish between here's the government and here are private companies? Never the twain shall meet, almost like separation of church and state. Or um, have they forgotten along with, it seems, local, state, and and uh, judicial in in Iowa? Well, I, I start just by want to clarify, it's our, our clinic was the one that filed the amicus brief, and that was worked on primarily by two of our fantastic, one of our former fantastic students, Rebecca Garverman, and a current student, Ashton McFarland, who was there with me at the court today. Uh, and a clinic's ever seen by our amazing clinic director, Kathy Meyer, who was also in the courtroom today as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of these questions you bring up have, have been addressed in a lot of the earlier cases uh, along these lines. So when the uh, ban on battery cages, uh, the sales ban went into effect in California several years ago, there was a huge consortium of different uh, agricultural states that were suing. And basically the state of Missouri was leading that and they were suing on behalf of these egg producers. And the court just said, like, you don't have standing to sue on behalf of these private companies uh, and threw the case out and said, you just basically have to refile as their own. But they kept trying again and, and didn't do it that way. So it's it's exactly what you're talking about, the sort of marriage between sort of government and, and private industry, uh, thinking that they're sort of one and the same. Um, and and you've, yeah, you've seen other similar similar actions. And you remember, uh, I think Amy Meyer was the first person ever uh, prosecuted under an ag gag law in the United States, uh, also in Utah. And she was on the same sort of thing. She was on a public thoroughfare. She was on a public road. And the police arrested her. And it turns out the, uh, the facility she was filming where these cows were being shoved along with back end loaders and forklifts, um, turns out that the mayor had a, had a financial interest in, in that uh in that facility. So that also leads why the, the police were then, of course, the charges were dropped because it turns out it was totally not a violation to, to have arrested her that way. But it was extra ironic because um, her actual, the represent the, the uh, legislator who represents that area was one of the lead voices swearing up and down that the ag gag law would never, ever be misapplied when they were trying to get it passed. And in there in its very own district, you have the first ever use of it being a total misapplication. So Simone Reyes, you are a well-known animal rescuer here in Los Angeles, as well as Vice President of Communications for Social Compassionate Legislation, which has passed dozens of bills in Sacramento on behalf of animals. Are we at a crucial turning point right here, right now, this moment, where the Supreme Court is going to decide whether to go with the will of the people? In California, 63% of voters voted yes on prop 12 which would ban those hideous crates or is the supreme court going to side with industry it's the pork industry that has gone all the way up to the supreme court after getting rejected in lower courts to say uh this affects interstate commerce well this is always going to be what we come up against right we are always positioned to be people that care more about animals which isn't true. We care about social justice. We've always been positioned to be people that um, don't care if people lose their jobs. Meanwhile, we're often the people that are making farms that are involved in horrific acts of cruelty and helping them financially with, um, with uh, a lot of uh, support to switch over to um, you know businesses that involve plants and growing mushrooms and things like that. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, we've, we've reached all the way to the Supreme Court. And when you see the propaganda that's being put out there, that's pretty much what it is, that we don't care about workers' rights. We don't care about, you know, the economy. We only care about animals, which is obviously not true. And the fact that so many non-vegans, non-vegetarians have voted to uphold, you know, uh, this proposition makes it obvious that people do care about animals and they don't even have to identify as vegan or vegetarian to do so. People see the videos, they see the images, and they know the difference between right and wrong. We can only hope that the Supreme Court also sees that and represents the people. Now, I want to say, Chris Green, you were at the Supreme Court today, and so were a lot of other demonstrators. Uh, let's go to uh, this video from People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. This morning, the Supreme Court is listening for, to the greedy pig people who deny just one foot of space in front of a pig's snout 
from one foot of space to their side for their entire life just for a strip of bacon. It just shows how awful, how greedy, how profiteering, and how callous these people are. And the only way to stop this is to take personal responsibility. Don't eat pigs, they're just like you and me. So Chris Green, what is their argument? The pork industries. The California people overwhelmingly voted in favor of Prop 12 way back in 2018. It was supposed to already be in effect, but they keep challenging it legally. Lower courts keep saying nothing to see here. They've taken it all the way up to the Supreme Court. So a lot of times these nuanced legal arguments go right over our heads. Is there a way you can boil down what their argument is and what the argument against their argument is? Their argument is that when you place standards such as this, uh, it creates uh, what they call an extraterritorial effect, that you've got one state dictating what the uh, production method should be in another state. Um, and then if that doesn't work, they go to this, this pike balancing test and saying, OK, well, even if you were allowed to do it, there should be a balancing. And they're saying the economic impact to their in-state producers uh, is not outweighed by California's uh, voters caring about animals. Um, that very pointedly, pointedly ignores uh, the public health and safety arguments, as we just discussed earlier, which are significant. Uh, they're trying to frame it as, tip, as, as simply a, 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 an animal welfare versus dollars and cents uh, argument and saying dollars and cents should always prevail. Um, however, the, the problem that they run into is that the Dormant Commerce Clause is basically there to protect uh, against protectionism. So it's, it's to prevent a state from saying, OK, we're going to set a certain standard for out of state goods, but we won't apply that same standard to in state goods as a way to protect their own domestic industry. Um, but that's certainly not the case that's happening. That's going on here uh, with Prop 12 and a lot of these other cases, uh, laws. Um, the standards apply equally to both in state producers and out of state producers. To me, it's simply a, a, a question of, of free market letting free markets work. So those producers that decide it's still profitable to comply with California's standards in order to be able to sell into the California market will do so. Those that don't, won't. Um, no one's forcing their product. No one's forcing any of these producers to sell their products into California. They don't have any right to sell, necessarily sell their, right, their, their products into California. Um, they're choosing to do so, and, and they have the right to choose not to do so. If they don't want to comply with the standards, they can just sell their pork to any of the other 49 states. Well, one of the issues, and I don't think it should be relevant, but California, where I'm sitting right now, where Simone is, uh, just happens to be the fifth largest economy in the world. If California were its own country, it'd be the fifth largest economy. So what happens here in California, you know that, Simone, it spreads to the rest of the world. We saw this with the Cruelty-Free Cosmetics Act that was passed here. Uh, and, and you the were instrumental. Ban. Go ahead. And the puppy mill ban. You know, we were told here that there would be no way to uh, to make it so that when you go into a pet shop and you are only offered a rescue animal, what? That was so out there that all the other large animal groups said, don't even try it. Don't waste your money on lobbyists. It'll never pass. And now that we were able to do that, it literally broke, you know, the ceiling so that other uh, states are, are copying it. Just like, as you said, the Cosmetics Act, once so goes California, so goes the world. That is what we have heard over and over again. You have the fur ban as well. Fur ban ha happened, and that's had a ripple effect on a lot of the, uh, the you know the major fashion houses, and, and other states are, are looking at doing the same as well. So yeah, you're right in the money with what happens in California, ends up you know going around the world. Uh, there was a very good question here from one of our viewers: Are the justices going to see the actual behind the scenes footage, or hiding the facts as the Smithfield trial judge tried to do? Now, we know that the jury acquitted Wayne Shung and Paul Picklesheimer, despite the fact that they were not allowed to see the horrific video of what actually happens inside these factory farms. And I'm going to show a very short video because it really is uh, disturbing. We don't want to traumatize anybody. 26 se seconds to give you an idea. So you can see most of these crates are intact but some of them have literally been busted open because these poor mother pigs are so desperate to escape they smash their faces up against these steel bars until there's a hole that's broken open and they had to jury rig this crate door shut 
with tape. And you can see she's falling on the side of her face. She's got a nasty cut. All right, so I want to ask you, Chris, are they going to see any footage of real gestation crates? Because you could write a book about pig gestation crates, but one image and one video, especially of the screaming pigs, which literally has given me nightmares, literally, that is more valuable in terms of showing the cruelty. Absolutely. Our, our clinic director, Catherine Meyer, was adamant that the amicus brief, again, there was several different amicus briefs submitted. Ours was the one primarily, for our clinic's one was the one primarily focused on animal welfare, and it represented Mercy for Animals and other organizations, other law professors and academic programs. But she was adamant that we put as many photographs and videos as we can into the actual brief. Uh, and so that took a lot of work to embed those and find a way to make a printed version of that as well. Um, but all the justices and their clerks uh, certainly have an amicus brief that has plenty of horrific video uh, and a lot of images. Uh, we leaned heavily on uh, Joanne MacArthur and We Animals Media for their, a lot of their wonderful images too and and some video from, from Mercy for Animals. So they've got it in front of them, whether they choose to watch it or not is beyond our control, but at least they will be exposed to it. And they'll have several months to to, to gnaw on this and, and, and dig into it. And so there's a good chance that they will. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, Nathan Semmel, my question is, is there any way, I understand you listened to some of the oral arguments today. I know Chris was at the Supreme Court, but you were listening uh, as an attorney remotely. Um, is there any way to get a sense as to whether or not these justices were sympathetic because they're human beings too. Uh, and when you see that, I have often said, if you are okay with taking a look at all these pigs screaming at the top of their lungs in these pig gestation crates because they can't turn around, this is what is at issue. Crates, the size essentially of their bodies, described by Wayne Shung as tombs, just being trapped in a living tomb. Um, if you if you can't see the inherent cruelty in that, I honestly think you need to go see a psychiatrist. Is there any way that that you could get a sense of whether their their questions were expressing some kind of sympathy or empathy? Yeah, I mean, Jane. Just first of all, you know, how could anybody see this and not and 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 claim with a straight face that? The state of California doesn't have an interest in um, protecting its citizens and its animals um, from, you know, perpetuating this. Um, it's it's absurd. Um, of course, uh, the state does. And um, I know the solicitor general for the state of California spoke about the long history in our country and, uh, you know, the religious history uh, and just uh, historical um, importance of, of treatment of, of animals. So, um, you know, I, I was glad to hear that mentioned. I, to your question regarding um, trying to get a read off of um, the judges, that's always very, very difficult because you never quite know necessarily why a judge is asking a particular question. Sometimes they're trying to make a point um, with the question. It would, might sound like a, a bad question for one side actually is a good one because they're trying to make a point with a colleague who sees it differently and they're hoping that the answer that's given will sway the other side. Um, but I was pleased to hear, you know, the animal cruelty, um, you know, playing such a big part uh, in the record. Um, you know, I think some judges, justices try to steer it towards there really not being anything about health and um, safety, which is normally what we would see in commerce clause, clause cases. Um, but I think the uh, the attorneys did a good job um, swinging it, swinging it back to uh, the state's interest in uh, preventing animal cruelty, uh, but also discussing how there really is a big uh, effect uh, in terms of um, you know in terms of safety and health. Okay, so I want to point out, first of all, it could be months before this decision comes in. And unfortunately, these pigs will remain in these crates uh, while the justices are weighing this decision. Uh, I want to just show this. This uh, was from ABC News, and I found it offensive. Supreme Court battle over cruelty, in quotes, 
to pregnant pigs could affect pork prices, animal care. Um, I want to go to Carla Cabral and Curtis. Let's start with you, Curtis. I mean, when you see a headline with this, it's I call it carnist media. Imagine if you put, uh, let's say, a human being in the same situation. Would they uh, talk about it in terms primarily of, you know, economic impact? Of course not. Uh, and yet that seems like ABC News to write that. I found it um, really biased. Uh, and so much of the coverage is biased. What are your thoughts on that? You know, they always say the liberal media, but really quite often the media reflects the least progressive mentality of society at large. Yeah, I mean, you can just just look at that and you can kind of get into the mind of of the author or maybe the the, you know, ABC as a whole or wherever that came from. I can't remember what you said, but ABC, uh, yeah, ABC or their, their editors and, and what they're thinking. And when I see this, I see, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a complete contradiction. You're talking about pigs and then you're talking about pork, you know, you're, you're objectifying these animals and you are claiming that they're pieces of, of property, that they're food, they're objects, they're, they're things to exploit. And it's, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at some of the headlines from Wayne and Paul's trial, you see people, some of them talking about, you know, activists being acquitted on, on theft of, of property. And you see some of them that say things along the lines of activists acquitted in pig rescue, you know. So uh, it, it, I also find it interesting that it seems like a lot of the, the right wing media has actually been a lot more sympathetic to the animal rights cause over the last couple of years. I don't know what it is about that or why, but uh, some of the headlines uh, and, and the press from the more right leaning uh, publications have been surprisingly good and, and oftentimes better than the ones on the left for, for whatever well, it's worth. You're bringing up a very important point. Uh, the Biden administration sides with the pork producers on this issue. So I, I'm quite shocked at that. The, our current administration sided with the pork producers before the U.S. Supreme Court. I am really just heartbroken. Um, I want to get Chris Green, your reaction to that. Yeah, the day that was filed, I nearly went out and bought a Let's Go Brandon t-shirt. I was so mad. Uh, I didn't. But uh, yeah, it's really perplexing. What the, their excuse was that the Department of Justice wants to have um, some continuity, uh, that they don't just want their positions to completely flip each time there's an election and, and someone else takes over the executive branch. But you know, the whole part of the reason that Joe Biden was elected is because we wanted a change in policies from the previous administration. So um, it's also, even just surely from a a surely self, politically self-interested point of view, it's a little bizarre as well that you're, as a, as a, a Democratic administration, that you're going to spit in the face of 63% of California voters in order to appease red state ag interests that would never support a Democrat anyway. It just seems really odd. But one fascinating point that you brought up, though, is that you know a lot of these animal protection issues do really transcend any sort of partisan traditional partisan political valence uh for year after year after year the number one most humane voter in in congress according to hsus was rick santorum um samuel alito was the lone dissent in the stevens uh crush video case and he said some really strong things about animal welfare and animal rights and, and animal harm um and i think they both come at it from a catholic uh, sort of all God's creatures, sanctity of life point of view. They, they, you know, Santorum certainly walked that walk uh, and did just talk it. Well, I want to bring in Carla Cabral, who uh, really did incredible work live for us from the scene of the trial all week, bringing us not only Curtis, but Wayne and Paul and everybody outside court. Now, um, in the wake of the not guilty verdicts on all counts, there is, there's media attention. It, you know, there was very little, very little media attention during the trial. Even the pool reporter who had the camera in the courtroom, their um, news organization never did a story about the trial itself until the verdict. Uh, but once that not guilty verdict came in, 
I think it shocked so many people. It was in the New York Times. And also check this out from Democracy Now! In Utah, a jury acquitted two animal rights activists this weekend who face years in prison for rescuing two sick piglets from Smithfield Circle Four Farms in Utah, one of the world's largest pig farms. It's a major victory for the animal rights group Direct Action Everywhere, which has been fighting to establish a right to rescue animals in distress. During the rescue operation, activists with the group found piglets feeding on their own mother blood, pregnant pigs held in gestational crates too small for them to turn around in, and sick and feverish piglets left to die of starvation or be trampled. So Carla Cabral, what is your take on where society is at? We don't, we, we don't know how the Supreme Court's going to rule, but everybody, I think, well, maybe not everybody. I was certainly shocked, pleasantly shocked, thrilled, but pleasantly shocked at the 100% not guilty verdicts. Um, were you surprised and do you think that indicates a societal shift? Well, honestly, I can't say that I was not surprised. Uh, I was thrilled, of course, and I do think that this is a shift in society. And I think that it's important that we bring up whistleblowers and we talk about how important these investigations are. And I think people are starting to realize that, that these corporations, they absolutely want to hide what is going on, but people want the truth. I believe that. And it's very important that we continue forward and provide that truth so that people can see what's happening and they can make informed decisions. And on that note, I want to update you guys to let you know that um, Wayne and Paul on the heels of this immediately went to the FBI. Wayne went to the FBI office in Southern Utah with evidence in hand to report Smithfield for violations of the PACT Act, which is the Protecting Animals from Cruelty and Torture Act. So he was able to go into the FBI office and speak with a couple of agents. And they had a really good conversation, a really frank conversation. Uh, Wayne did a live stream about that. Um, you know, they talked about how the FBI had really no expertise in animal cruelty issues and that the office had never done an animal cruelty case. And so really we should be going to the USDA, uh, but we have in fact done that before. And if we're unable to get uh, through to the USDA, then perhaps we want to even start our own, um, you know, go to the legislature and maybe even form a department of animal rights. Uh, that's something to, that we are looking to do in the future. And then on the heels of talking with the FBI, both Wayne and Paul went right back to Circle Four Farms today. They live streamed. They went right back to Circle Four Farms. They were hoping to be able to speak perhaps with an employee there. Uh, they were not able to do so. Security was following them immediately. Uh, but this is far from over. And when I see headlines like you showed before, I do also get a sense of fear mongering that there is there is a part of the press that feeds on the idea that, you know, if we can make people afraid, uh, then maybe they won't pass this because people don't want to pay more. Uh, but I think people will pay more, just like we see with things like cage free and organic and and such people are willing to pay more if they know that situations like are seen in these videos are not actually happening. I wonder, Chris, if the U.S. Supreme Court justices know that the Utah voters found these investigators who went into this factory farm specifically to see if they still had these cruel gestation crates that they were acquitted on all counts. I would think if I'm trying to determine, well, what's the will of the people, that would be a pretty good indicator. That's not, you know, Brooklyn or Venice, California. That's Utah, a heavily agricultural state that found these two men not guilty on all counts. Chris. There was, a, there was an example in, in Arizona a few years back. There was this bill that was trying to take livestock out of the cruelty code and put them in their own completely separate uh, area that would only be policed by the Arizona Department of Agriculture. 
And there was polling out there showing 87% of Arizona voters opposed this. And no matter how you sliced it, rural, urban, gender, uh, Democrat, independent, Republican, the, the smallest segment was 82%. I think it was 84% of Republicans also opposed that. And so we killed that bill the first couple of times when I was at ALDF. Uh, and in the third year, it snuck through and uh, attached to something else. And it went to Governor Doug Ducey's desk. And on a, I think went on a Thursday, and he had five days to decide whether or not to sign or veto this this bill. And so all the animal advocacy groups uh, kicked into action and mobilized their their supporters in the state. And by Monday morning, uh, Doug Ducey had nineteen thousand two hundred forty eight calls, messages, or emails asking him to veto the bill. Guess how many calls, emails he had asking him to sign it? Yeah. Three. So when you're an elected official, 19,248 to three is pretty simple math. And so he vetoed it. And the language in the veto letter is amazing because basically uh, Katie Brophy McGee, this other legislator, did a backdoor deal with the ag industry and said, they said, okay, we'll let you have this a couple extra protections for cats and dogs if you let us do whatever we want to farmed animals. Uh, and she took that deal without checking with any of the advocacy groups. And so Doug Ducey in his letter saying, all animals in Arizona to, do, to be protected regardless of species or regardless of category. And we're not going to let uh, you know, protections for one animal come at the expense of another animal. I mean, it's really strong language. So here we've got a Republican governor and Republican state uh, vetoing a bill that was pushed by one of the, strong, the biggest industries in the state. But he did so because that's what the people wanted, overwhelmingly so, again, in a, in a very strong red state. How long is it going to be before the U.S. Supreme Court makes a decision? And Nathan, as a former uh, assistant district attorney and an attorney in New York, what just like when we were on trial watch, we were all going, well, the fact that they're out for so many hours, does that mean they're leading toward guilt and innocence? Give us a sense of like, where are we here? These arguments, I guess, are finished. I don't know. And now they just consider it. Do they talk amongst themselves? What happens? First of all, I don't do appellate work. So let me just premise it with uh, with that. Um, I just do trial work. But I... I reached out to a friend of mine today who does uh, appellate work to ask this very question. And what my understanding is, is that generally in cases that are, you know, a slam dunk where it's expected to be a nine zero decision, decisions can come as quickly as, as, as a month. But in cases that there is dispute and there will be dissents uh, that will be written, it can take any, it can take up to six months and we may not see a decision until the spring. Um, what will happen right now, the case is fully submitted, and now the justices will, Judge Roberts will pick somebody, I guess, to, uh, to draft the opinion, and they will start writing drafts uh, amongst themselves. They'll share them with one another. Their law clerks will work on it, and um, eventually a decision will, uh, will, be, will be reached and, and, and an opinion will be written. Chris could probably speak to this much better than I can. Not well, sure how you get there. I, I, I can't add one thing. Yeah, go ahead, please. Well, one thing that's really interesting about this case is that, um, you know, the Supreme Court denied cert for uh, to, to hear a challenge by in, in over Prop 12 uh, by a similar lawsuit uh, last summer before. Um, so they already looked at this and decided not to take it. So when it came up again, it goes on the calendar for the judges, justices to decide whether or not they're going to hear the case. Um, and it's usually dispensed up pretty quickly. They decide yay or nay, and they sometimes don't even give any reason why. It just appears on a list of whether they're taking it or not. But it kept appearing week after week after week after week, which is really extraordinary. Uh, it's not very common at all. Um, and then it disappeared for a couple of weeks, so we thought it might be done. But then it came back on again, um, and they just kept not deciding. And so you know that they need at least four justices to sign on to hear a case. So some have hypothesized that maybe that was it. They just, it was taking them a long time. There was someone who felt really strongly about this case, but they, they just couldn't get, uh, you know, enough, four more justices or three more justices to, to agree to hear it, but they maybe finally did. So that's actually kind of a, might be perceived as a good sign that if it took them that long just to find a fourth justice to even decide to hear the case, they may have trouble getting to five. Well, um, hopefully, right? I mean, everybody's been talking about how politicized this Supreme Court has become and how conservative it's become. Um, you know, we had the death of uh, notorious RGB and um, 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, the changes thereafter. So I don't want to get into politics whatsoever. Um, but I do feel like you have to think about uh, a few factors when when trying to figure out what might they do. But again, it is a total wild card because as has been mentioned by this panel, a lot of times uh, conservative voices are the ones who end up speaking up for animals. Uh, so it, there's really no way of telling. I will say, and Simone, you can comment on this, that it's one of the areas where you find the greatest bipartisanship. And you've seen that with social compassion legislation in Sacramento, where Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals who can't agree on anything can agree that it's wrong to do X, Y, Z to an animal. Simone. Well, that's absolutely true. And, you know, that's why we have to, as a group, always include everyone and put our own personal um, politics completely aside, because at the end of the day, it's for the animals. And we have had very, very strong support in, you know, places we never thought we would from staunch Republicans. It has happened and it's been wonderful. And, you know, it's sort of funny when, when, when you go into the Capitol and lots of times we bring a celebrity with us. Um, the sports people seem to have the most um, of the awe factor, like obviously the wonderful activist uh, and vegan John Sally. He he could walk into a Democrat's office or he could walk into a Republican's office and suddenly everybody's 12 years old meeting their hero. And so um, that's just really important to, you know, to realize at the end of the day, you know, Republicans and Democrats alike have often, you know, had a very important relationship with their first animal and they think about that when you explain to them that there's no difference in in any way between a, a pig or a cow or their first dog that they loved or their first cat that they loved so yes it's really important to foster those relationships and um and the animal rights community as a whole has to continue to reach out to every single other social justice movement as well we need to include everyone because the animals just you know <laughs> they need it. Right. And while not every animal rights organization was in favor of Prop 12, it did pass overwhelmingly. Full transparency. I collected signatures for Prop 12, as I also did for Prop 2 individually and stood outside a farmer's market. And it seemed like everybody I encountered was like, this is wrong. Absolutely. Um, give us a prediction, Chris, when <laughs> this decision will come down. <laughs> It's really hard to say, as we were just discussing, um, you know, even even this quote unquote slam dunk cases can still take a month or longer. Uh, so I don't think anyone's really expecting a, a decision here uh, too soon. It's probably going to be early spring at least. And and sometimes, you know, even when they know how they want to decide uh, in the aggregate, it really takes them a while to kind of hone exactly how they want to, to, to justify that in the opinion. So as you saw last year with the Dodds decision that the the opinion was was released leaked very early and you know it, it changed quite a bit since from then but you know it was pretty much in a, a finished form you know months before the, the the decision was actually handed down by the court so um yeah I, it's it's impossible to predict but we'll we'll certainly know by late next spring but uh I, that that could be that could be a while still wow and is there any lobbying that goes on behind the scenes um, while all this is just hanging in the wind, I mean, could obviously the meat and dairy industry, which is also aligned with the pharmaceutical industry, because one thing that nobody's talking about is that processed meat is a level one carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization. So, I mean, there's another health impact. It's not just that keeping these animals confined in these, in these uh, terribly extreme confinement of these cages can uh, create health issues because the animals get sick. But it's also that the food produced, which the industry constantly talks about, we're feeding protein to America and the world. Uh, the actual food that is produced, um, most of it, I would say, is, pr is consumed in a processed fashion, whether it's hot dogs, bacon, deli slices, it's officially a lever one carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization, Curtis. Uh, I mean, why is that not even part of the conversation? I think it will become part of the conversation as time goes on. I mean, it, it reminds me a lot of 
you know, the big tobacco industry and, and how there was this big struggle for a while. And then finally, you know, science and health industry experts won that battle. But for a long time, you had uh, <laughs> doctors on TV and on newsprint ads that were, you know, saying, I recommend these forms of cigarettes, or I recommend camel or, you know, I'm your local doctor and my favorite cigarettes are whatever. So you have this big industry, this big tobacco industry that is, you know, paying scientists to shill their products. Right. And we have that right now, but I think that that facade, uh, that lie is starting to show, you know, there's been uh, plenty of documentaries out now about the health impacts of meat. Uh, and, you know, it's only a matter of time before, that's really a, a, a case, a, a closed case type of scenario or situation. I mean, we all know that it is, but the industry is still doing a pretty good job at shielding that information to the everyday person. Uh, we're talking about so many breaking news issues as we do a, a verdict wrap up. Uh, the two DXC leaders who went into the Smithfield farm farm, massive industrialized facility with hundreds of thousands of pigs uh, were found not guilty for taking out two sick piglets and also oh. documenting the conditions that were so horrific that the jury wasn't even allowed to see them for fear of them making an emotional decision. And then we have the U.S. Supreme Court considering the whole issue of these pig gestation crates. And then we have a third breaking news aspect, which is that there is a court hearing tomorrow to um, essentially argue that these activists who were there in Utah, where this massive industrial fat, pig producing facility exists, by the way, it's owned by a Chinese company now. Smithfield is not an American company anymore. It's owned by the Chinese. Uh, where uh, they're doing their First Amendment right, leafleting, talking to people. Again, the law enforcement tried to stop them from doing that, and there's going to be a hearing tomorrow. I want to pay just a snippet of that confrontation again, and then we're going to talk about it on the other side. You have to have a permit. Permit to, to, uh, for a sidewalk? Let me get my camera on, too. Sure. Okay. You're not. This is not a good look. Gonna, you're not. You're not to be spread. This is not a good look. You're not supposed to be down here. This is public property. You're not to be down here doing this. Do you realize? Do you realize that your your company caused a problem in our community? Do you have anything relevant to say to me? Yes, I do. Okay. I've asked you to stop. Okay, I'm on public property. You need to stop. Okay. You need to stop. Do you realize you're not wanted in this community and you've been asked to leave? I don't care. I know you don't care. That's the problem with your group. You just don't care about people or anybody. Do you understand? You've been asked to leave. All of this for handing out some flyers. This is how much all, all of promotion. This is because, all of this because... Your your group has has been a direct influence on shutting down Smithfield Foods. You don't realize that's the major employer in our county. You don't think and I know that? Lot, there's a lot of people that have lost their jobs, and you come into this community and pour salt into the wounds of the people that have lost their jobs. It's not okay? the intent. You need to stick. Well, I don't care what the intent is. What you're doing is causing a disturbance in the community. I'm not Wow. I just, I can't, I kept saying, I'm just going to play a little snippet, but it's really hard for me to stop looking at that. Um, and that wasn't the only interaction. By the way, we invite that law enforcement officer on to Unshade TV, as well as Smithfield Foods, anybody representing uh, that community or the animal agriculture industry, we would love to dialogue with you. Um, that was, you filed a lawsuit. What is happening in court tomorrow, Curtis? And then I want to get the reaction of Carla. Tomorrow is uh, a motion to file um, a preliminary injunction against the police officers there in Beaver County, and that's happening in Salt Lake City in federal court. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're filing a uh, First Amendment lawsuit against them, First Amendment violation, and this preliminary injunction is just the first uh, 
the first step in this. Uh, I do want to say that, you know, as, as ridiculous as the things were said that were said from officer Woolsey there and his partner officer laws, I do think that they had good intentions and I do think that they, you know, they're not bad people. Uh, they were honestly looking out for their community, but they did, you know, swear an oath to uphold the constitution and they should be held accountable for violating that oath. And it's not just for me and not just for the animals that I was there, uh, on behalf of, but for other people moving forward and, and Lord knows how many people before me that that same thing happened to that people were probably too scared to to file a lawsuit or speak out against it. So th this this kind of stuff is outrageous. And uh, yeah, I mean, in the moment, it's just just ridiculous. It, it reminded me of the first uh, the first Rambo movie. I don't know if any of y'all remember that, but literally the first like 10 minutes of the Rambo movie, the police officer picks up Sylvester Stallone, drives him to the other side of town and says, you know, something along the lines of, we don't like your kind in this town or something. It's literally the exact same thing that happened. <laughs> um, and, and as a result of that, there was a change of venue and it went from the company town in Beaver over to Washington and St. George, Utah, which is um, has a reputation of being a more artsy town. That's where uh, Carla Cabral picks up because you were there and apparently the law enforcement in that new town where the trial was actually going to be held, St. George, Utah, they were told about this incident back in the other town. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, first, let me just say, Curtis, absolutely brilliant, amazing job, uh, incredible uh, with, with the Beaver County Police. Uh, I, in regards to that first, let me just say, I, I thought the irony of Officer Woolsey to talk about uh, us not caring uh, about people and then to turn around and he said he didn't in he did not care what our intent was especially when the trial itself really hinged on intent i thought the irony was um, uh, beautiful there uh, and yeah, in, in regards to uh, the next town, the new town, you were out there and the police had been trained about this in the new town. Like, don't make this mistake. Absolutely. They, the police, you know, they really seem to go out of their way to come over to us, to, to be extra nice, uh, to say that they were really happy that we were there and making sure that we were treated really well, uh, and we we know they said that they were shown the interaction between Curtis and Officer Woolsey, uh, so they would know what not to do. Wow. So I have to ask the two attorneys who are joining us. Um, first of all, Nathan, I could just, it was hard to keep up with all the rules this man was breaking. And again, I think it's very just generous of you to say that, oh, he's a nice guy. He was just standing up for his community. He's a law enforcement officer. He can't just say, you know, you're costing our town jobs. Get the, I, I, I can't even, there's, there's no words to describe this. Nathan, what rules has he broken just for those who are not aware? Yeah, I mean, listen, this country was founded on, we're supposed to have the free exchange of ideas, right? You know, the, the first amendment protects the right of speech, the right to assembly. Um, you know, what uh, Rambo, I mean, Curtis uh, did was really probably the lowest level of, um, you know, of, um, of, of exchange of ideas as, as you can have, which is just walking on a public sidewalk, handing out a leaflet. Um, it, you know, the, no, it, it really doesn't get any um, less troublesome for the community or for law enforcement than that. And I suspect if um, Curtis was holding a coupon for Smithfield uh, Foods and was handing it out to the public, he would have been left alone. And what you had here was, you know, what is tantamount, I think, to a selective prosecution, a selective enforcement of laws and harassment. Um, and there's no place for it here. It was certainly a violation of his First Amendment rights. Um, you know, I think what we saw from this officer was fear personified. 
Uh, he may have been coming from a place of, uh, you know, of, of, of good faith, trying to protect his community, trying to protect the economics in the community. That's not, that's not hey, his job. Uh, he is sworn to uphold the Constitution and protect the rights of individuals. And that's all that Curtis was doing, was exercising his rights. Yeah. And uh, again, Chris Green, as an attorney, um, you are uh, at Harvard, uh, an esteemed attorney. Uh, this is probably pretty basic for you, but what rules did he break? Well, well, the main thing is that when it comes to free speech is it's not just prohibiting someone from talking. It's it's prohibiting them based on what they're saying. And exactly he said time and time again, it was because of what they're doing and their message and what their message has done to that town. So it made it pretty clear that the whole reason he wanted to shut down his speech because he didn't like the content of that speech. And that's, that's as bad as it gets from a, a governmental intrusion point of view. Um, one thing that's really cool about this, unfortunately, I have to jump here in a minute to catch my flight. I'm still in the, the American lounge here at the DC airport. Um, but one thing is that it couldn't be more time. I was a little worried, as you said earlier, about how uh, Wayne and Paul's trial was not getting much attention. And I think because a lot of folks were, news outlets were waiting to write about the Prop 12 case until right before it went to the hearing. And so a lot of this week was flooded with information about pig welfare, but it was it was, it was was not Wayne and Mike's case, it was Prop 12. Um, but that's why I'm, I'm so glad that it was able to, to, to break through, like you said. But one fantastic timeliness aspect of that is on Thursday, I'm flying to Denver uh, to join my really great colleague, Professor Justin Marceau there. Um, and he at the University of Denver and their animal law program, just this very week are launching a whole new animal clinic uh, with students working in there. And it's focused exclusively on the legal defense of animal activists. So I think Justin has kind of given some advice uh, in the DXC case, uh, in the Smithfield case. But um, so, yeah, you've got all these people coming in to Denver on Thursday and Friday to talk about these very issues and that there's this whole new legal clinic devoted to exactly that. Um, and one last thing I'd like to leave with uh, back to Prop 12, anyone who is interested in the other issues that could be impacted by the court if if they decide uh, to, to go with the support that court producers position. Um, our amazing legislative policy fellow, Kelsey Eberly, who's a former attorney at ALDF and now is a clinical instructor at Yale, she wrote this amazing 60 page report for us this, with us this summer, um, you know, on the, on the potential reverberations of, of this, of the national pork producers case and how it could impact environmental laws, things related to climate, consumer pre protection, even like child exploitation. There's so many other uh, health, safety and welfare laws uh, that do have a, that, that could be jeopardized if, if the court decides the wrong way. So, um, Thanks again for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's always great to see you. But yeah, of course, I need to have my flights boarding in 25 or boarding now. So Chris I Green, need to, I need you to actually in. changed your flight in order to be <laughs> on the show. So I just want to say thank you. You are my hero. The uh, incredible work you do, the association with Harvard. I mean, it, you are a hero for our movement. Thank you so much for joining us. Anything for you, Jen, you're my hero. You really do persevere and you're out here doing this every single day and it really means a lot to the rest of us. It's a team effort. Thank you. Go get that flight of yours. Okay, you know Kathy's on the same flight. So <laughs> we're gonna be talking about the case the whole time, I bet. So well, take great. care. And, you know, let's 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 do an update. I mean, maybe in a couple of months, we're all gonna be back here talking about how the Supreme Court stood up for the uh, California's Prop 12. Uh, thank you so much. And I'll let you okay. go. In fact, I'll kick you out just so you make your flight. <laughs> I have a Thanks. good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say yeah, one thing. Sure. Um, he mentioned uh, Justin Marceau, and I was surprised he didn't um, uh, uh, mention that Justin Mar Marceau actually was a character witness in the Smithfield trial. Uh, maybe he just wasn't following along, but uh, after talking with Wayne and Paul about the the Smithfield trial and kind of asking them like, what do you think the turning point was? You know, when did the judge kind of maybe ease off a little bit and kind of treat you all with a little more respect and kind of take this more seriously? Uh, Wayne thinks it was after Justin's uh, testimony, the first witness. I mean, this, this, uh, the just Justin Marceau guy, uh, he's a, pro a law professor uh, in Denver. I don't even know all of his accreditations, but I know that there are a lot. And when he started rifling them off, both the judge and the prosecution was like, whoa, like, holy shit. Like this guy's a, you know, 
kind of a big deal. And uh, it gave Wayne a lot of a lot of credibility. And yeah, what like was I was his saying, main point. What was his main point in the testimony? Well, no, not necessarily his main point. Just his just his his like his credentials. What he had done. Yeah, his credentials yeah. essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the same with uh with Chris, who you just heard from. You know, he is, and I gotta read it because it's got it's a long title. He's the executive director of the Brooks McCormick's Junior Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School. So we are not just we. You know, they like to characterize us. Um, Simone as sort of people who are not that there's anything wrong with hanging upside down from a tree, uh, but it's sort of kooky people who hang upside down from a tree. You know, I'm a journalist. Uh, you're an attorney. We've got firefighters. We've got Harvard law professors. We've got um, people who are all over the map. I wish we could get more of them into um, the mainstream media to rise up much as women have risen up in media and said, no, I'm not going to just be confined or consigned to covering fashion, you know, uh, much as uh, people of color have said, we want all these stories covered. We don't want to be left out of the equation or only brought on as a panelist when we're talking about uh, issues that directly reflect our community. We want to be part of the action all the time. There have been uprisings in media uh, as people uh, demand a seat at the table. And so I always say, if you care about animals and you enjoy journalism, go to journalism school. That's what I did. I graduated from NYU with a degree in broadcast journalism. Um, I won't tell you when though, <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> okay, let's put it this way. It's a really good school now. It wasn't so great when I went there. Okay, um, Simone though, I mean, your thoughts on that, that, that really, um, if there's a societal shift happening now, um, and it, this has just occurred to me, there could be secret animal lovers on the Supreme Court. Because if you're an animal lover, you are just, it's in your DNA. And you don't know. Uh, people might not reveal that. But there are people who just have politics aside, policy aside, everything aside. They just have a warm spot in their heart for animals. Simone. Up. Uh, in many people's DNA once they've made that connection to an animal. Um, but you know what? Over the years, because of social media, being vegan, being animal rights is the cool club to be in. We're Oscar winners. We're Grammy winners. We're physicians. We're lawyers. We're, I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. And some of the people that actually have the most social, you know, reach in the millions are vegans. So it, it's, it, there's no way that we can be, you know, seen as a small minority group when, um, when votes matter. And there are many times when, you know, bills have come up and it just makes the most sense to have one celebrity who's on the side of animals, you know, make a tweet about it. And legislators and politicians have began, begun to realize that it matters, you know, it, I mean, it's, it sounds funny to say it, but it matters what, you know, Billie Eilish might say on social media. And if she decides to target somebody and, you know, tweet about them, that's not going to look good for them when people take their time to vote, especially younger people. So yes, our, our numbers are growing, but also the, um, the, the kind of people that are choosing to be out, <laughs> you know, today is today's national coming out day, right? So the people that come out as vegan, right? It matters. And we have, uh, our numbers are growing every day, but it means a lot when Kim Kardashian, you know, becomes a spokesperson for Beyond Meat. It just does. Yeah. Okay. Well, I agree with you hundred percent. And uh, I think that this waiting game is going to be very interesting. I would say that that the Supreme Court uh, is filled with individuals, people. And I certainly think that social media campaigns urging them to do the right thing is absolutely appropriate uh, and call for. Um, just like we would, uh, and we have, um, mobilized and vocalized for other major issues. We don't even need to mention what they are. We all know what they are. Um, so as a final roundtable here, I want to start 
with Carla. Where are we right now? This has been the most extraordinary week, perhaps, in the history of the animal rights movement. You had uh, this trial where it was sort of considered really a, a strong case for the prosecution, not because of what they did, but because where it was happening in a very agricultural area where there were so many people who were connected to the industry. And it was just an absolute 100 percent victory for um, the animal activists. In fact, here is the victory poster that was put up uh, after the not guilty verdicts. Then you have right on the heels of that, um, the U.S. Supreme Court considering whether or not these pig gestation crates, which I think all you have to do is take one look at them and realize these animals have to stay in there for their whole lives. They can't turn around. Obviously, it's torture. Obviously, it's barbaric, primitive, medieval. And we are better than that, hopefully, as a human species. I couldn't even believe that such a thing existed. I remember the first time I saw it, uh, maybe it was a decade or two ago, and I said, there's no way this has to be, this can't be true. And yet, and, and this is something I, I do want to cover before we go, because I had thought about it when I was listening to some of the arguments. Carla, the uh, pork industry even presents this perverse argument that it's better for the pigs. Have you heard this? Oh, absolutely. I've heard that. Uh, you know, we've watched so much footage from Smithfield's ads, uh, and they have a, a lovely one where they talk about the necessity. This is an absolute necessity for the mother pigs to be in these crates. It's actually very good for them, uh, for their protection. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it's propaganda at its best. And, you know, this is the battle that we're really up against is the propaganda put out by the industry. People want to believe that they're not doing anything wrong by making the choices that they make. As Curtis said, with, with Sergeant Woolsey not being a bad person, we believe that in general, uh, I mean, people are not bad people. It's just they're not getting the information. And on the heels of the not guilty verdict with this trial, and we'll just have to see what happens with the Supreme Court. But I think people are waking up. Uh, as long as we can get the true footage, we can get the real story about what's happening to these pigs and to animals all over the world, I think we're going to see a shift. I really believe that, that we are going to see change soon. It's hard to recognize progress in real time. Uh, but I do feel that was a turning point in history, the acquittal of Wayne Shung and Paul Picklesheimer. And um, Nathan Semmel, um, the question to me is, just like the media is behind the times, they're not as hip to animal rights. They're not as hip to veganism. They're not the mainstream media. It's sort of disconnected from where the kids are on social media which is very vegan friendly, very animal friendly. I just wonder, uh, is the Supreme Court, you know, behind the times on this issue? I hope not, but I do have to wonder how much of this is going to be a strictly legal, legal ruling based on the technicalities and how much is it going to be from the heart, Nathan? I, I think it'll probably be mostly um, a legal analysis. That's what they're, I suppose, supposed to do. But they're all human beings. Um, some have shown far more humanity uh, than others in, in, in other cases. But, you know, we don't know where they stand on uh, when it comes to animals. And as we've discussed earlier on this show, um, we've gotten friends in places that we would never have expected to, to see. And there was a lot of talk about the history and importance of, uh, of caring for animals in this country. And that there are religious roots uh, there as well. So that sort of, you know, crosses a lot of different um, um, uh, people. And I'm hoping that these justices um, recognize that 62% of Californians, it's not 62% of 
um, of, of vegans or 62% of vegetarians. It's 62% of all people in California, most of whom um, eat meat, want this. It's important to them. And the state of California has a real interest in seeing that um, the cruelty that is important to these people, um, that, that, that anything contra contradictory to that is not sold uh, in their state. And it's hard to see how the justices of the Supreme Court could thumb their nose, even though it's California and even though there are conservative judges here, it's still a resounding number. And when we see other laws around the country when it comes to battery cages um, for chickens and, um, you know, and, and other areas, they have to pay attention to it. So I think the humanity will seep in. But I think more than anything, I think we went on the law. I really do. Um, well, I want to say okay. that some of the arguments that I was reading um, showed that this, as you mentioned, could have a profound impact on a whole bunch of things like environmental laws, like all sorts of protections that have been instituted by certain states that if you decide, well, one state can, can't pass a law within their state that affects other states, you're basically throwing out like a huge percentage of laws that states have passed. And I think it could create complete chaos. I mean, that is something, uh, Carla, that I think the justices are going to have to consider, right? Oh, absolutely. I was reading uh, yesterday a, an article that that talked about that very issue of, you know, if California, uh, ha if this passes and California can uh, push it, its ideas on other states, what about other states trying to push their ideas on how we grow avocados or almonds or something? So, yeah, that definitely is something that they're going to have to keep in mind. No, I'm saying, well, I understand what you read, but what I'm saying is the opposite. If they oh. ruled in favor of the pork industry, well, there are plenty of states, I'm sure all states that have passed laws that say you can't sell products that have X, Y, Z in our state. OK, just because California happens to be the fifth largest economy doesn't mean that, um, oh, well, because its impact is bigger, that therefore we can stop them, but not stop all these other states. Right. So the in the ripple effect, if they were to uh, overturn Prop 12, the ripple effect would be absolutely enormous. And I honestly think that could be one of the biggest factors that even animal welfare aside could have them saying, no, we don't want. That's why the lower courts threw threw this out. Uh, and I have to go back to Nathan on that. Well, you know, it would be nice to see, Jane, it would be nice to see the federal government actually get a little bit more involved here and maybe pass a pass federal legislation that would ban gestation crates, because well, that would solve this once and for all, wouldn't it? No, and you It's know, sad, but the government has created this problem. I didn't mean to interrupt. The, the administration is siding with the pork industry. The administration gives tens of millions of dollars of subsidies to these industries with a precious, tiny, little, minuscule percentage to fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains that humans actually eat. The government is the problem. It is creating the climate crisis by subsidizing these industries. So forget about waiting for the government to do the right thing. You know, that's, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, they are bought and paid for by this industry, just like the mainstream media. The media is you don't have to be a brain surgeon. You see the commercials that are playing uh, during the commercial breaks of your show. Are you going to bring up something that is potentially catastrophic for those industries, fast food and pharmaceuticals? They don't even use the word slaughterhouse. During the COVID pandemic, when slaughterhouse workers were dying at, in large numbers in slaughterhouses, the word slaughterhouse was never mentioned. They say food processing facilities. You know, I mean, we're, we're talking about moral bankruptcy. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're dealing with. Um, and I, I didn't mean to uh, snap at you. I was just being passionate about this issue. Um, <laughs> apologies if it sounded like I get, I get angry it. because people are waiting for the government. You know, the government is the bad guy in this case, Simone Reyes. Well, yes, yes. The government has a history of being 
the bad guy. But luckily, the government doesn't have, um, well, they have a lot of power. They don't have as much power in terms of feeding what they want to uh, the people as they used to. And, you know, thank goodness in this country, we are able to share quite freely on social media. And that is why so many things are changing so rapidly because there is so many people right now, there are so many people who are getting their news, especially the younger generations, not from ABC, CBS, you know, not from those stations at all. They're getting it on their feed, on their phone, from Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, all of that stuff. And that is where the animal rights movement is shining because we are able to show the images and show the videos. And that is why we are actually a force to be reckoned with. And that's why we started Unshamed TV to get around the mainstream media's news blackout on animal rights and veganism and offer people who are looking for free content via their Apple TV device, their Roku device, or their Amazon Fire Stick device, or their cell phone. We, you can download us for free right now on your cell phone. You just go to your app store and put in Unshamed TV. You don't have to put in your email or anything. It pops right up. And there it is. And that's why we started it. It's right there. And this is streaming live right now on that app. So we have live capability. We're going to be covering all these trials. We're, uh, for example, going to, thank you. Uh, we're going to the Animal Rights Conference in D.C. next week. And uh, within a week, and we're going to be going live with movers and shakers at that conference. Um, we are going to also be giving major organizations like DXC and other organizations, their own shows, if they'd like, um, so that they can highlight their actions and their plans and their projects. So, Curtis, I think you're going to get the final word today. Uh, where are we as a society? This has been one of the most extraordinary weeks in the history of the animal rights movement. And possibly thanks to you, <laughs> there's been a positive outcome. Um because you got that change of venue uh, because of what that officer did that we played on the tape. Uh, so where are we as a society? Sure, yeah. Before I answer your question, I do want to flag one thing. And I think one of your viewers actually brought this up. But another legal court hearing deal that's happening tomorrow is the sentencing hearing for Amy Serrano and Nick Schaefer in the Excelsior 4 trial. Uh, they, were, they were found guilty uh, about a month ago and their sentencing hearing is tomorrow. So I, I, I haven't been following that probably as closely as I should. I don't know if there's jail time uh, or if there is a potential for jail time, but that is definitely something that people should, uh, uh, keep on the radar. But as far as your question about like where we are as a society, um, I'm not sure, but I do know that the rate of change of the social justice movements is definitely not, uh, linear and, here at DXC, we are huge uh, history nerds and, and we do our homework. That's one of our core values is that we do our homework. And just looking back at these past social justice movements, whether it be uh, women's suffrage or uh, gay marriage or interracial marriage, what you saw in the past is you see like a state here, do it, a state here, do it, a state here, do it. And then all of a sudden, everyone does it. You know, it might be really slow for a long time, but then all of a sudden, boom, like it's gone. You know, they see the writing is on the wall. And another thing to, to keep in mind is that a lot of these movements relied on a very small percentage of people like doing the, the on the ground activism. As far as, you know, uh, the direct action, the marching, all of that. Uh, very small percentage of, of people during the height of the civil rights movement, the March on Washington, for example, that was only 0.13% of the population at that March. Uh, women's suffrage in the UK, it was like 0.008% of people at their highest mobilization. So I, I personally would like to see um, more people out on the streets, more people taking action, um, and at the very least supporting this type of stuff. So that would be my uh, my call to action to people is to, to find your voice and get active in, in whatever way that you can. Well, I want to thank everybody for watching. If you want to get active right now, a very easy way is just to download the Unshamed TV app free on your phone. You just go to your app store, put in Unshamed TV. Voila, it's there. Um, you can also watch it online at UnchainedTV.com 
Also, go to righttorescue.com and get involved. Go to Direct Action Everywhere. Um, there's tons of Facebook pages and Instagram pages and all sorts of websites that focus on different aspects of the animal rights movement. Uh, you can support social compassionate legislation and uh, just stay active, like even hitting the share button on this video, that will allow it to be seen by more people. So uh, we will get there. Uh, I think that I'm gonna be nervous for a couple of months till this uh, decision comes down. Uh, but as uh, has been said by someone far wiser than myself, the uh, arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. So on that note, Thank you so much for joining us. Heroes all. I appreciate it. Rock on. Thanks, Jane. Thank you.